afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins, president of City Club, and I'd like to welcome you all, those of you here with us today at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Thank you for joining City Club today on March 11th for this week's Friday Forum. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, would everyone please make sure their cell phones are silenced? Today, Susan Herman, National President of the ACLU, will discuss the defense of civil liberties in Oregon and America. But first, a few announcements. Last week, Governor Kitzhaber kicked off City Club's From Crisis to Opportunity series, which focuses on finding innovative solutions to Oregon's fiscal challenges. On March 29th, the club's new Leaders' Council is offering a workshop where participants will actually attempt to successfully balance our state budget. To participate in this event, and I know you don't want to miss it, or to learn about other upcoming events, go to the City Club web website, which is pdxcityclub.org. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and I'd also like to offer our appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors whose generous financial support make these forums possible. We'd like to thank our new spring quarter sponsors, Northwest Natural and Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt, and our other spring sponsor, Morell Inc., is here with us today. And if our sponsor table would please rise, we'd all like to welcome you and thank you. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club offices. Finally, your gift to City Club's spring annual fund campaign supports the forums, events, and research studies that are so valued by our members and so important to the health of our community. Our strategic plan challenges the club to develop new interactive ways to engage a more diverse group of citizens in making our communi community better for all. In order to achieve this, we need to accomplish our annual fund goal of raising $25,000 over the next three months. Please make a generous contribution today using the donation envelopes on your table or pick one up in the back of the room. You can also donate directly on the club's website perhaps when you make your next forum reservation. And now to today's program. While sometimes viewed as a controversial organization, the American Civil Liberties Union, best known as the ACLU, works to defend civil liberties, such as First Amendment rights and the right to equal protection under the law. Today, the ACLU national president, Susan Herman, will speak to the City Club about the tension between maintaining national security and preserving civil liberties such as freedom of speech and due process. She will also address legal issues surrounding race and incarceration and will explain why Oregonians should be concerned about violations of civil, civil liberties wherever they occur. Susan was elected president of the American Civil Liberties Union in 2008 after having served on the ACLU National Board of Directors for 20 years as a member of the executive committee for 16 years and as general counsel for 10. She holds a chair as Centennial Professor of Law at Brooklyn Law School, where she currently teaches courses in constitutional law and criminal procedure, and seminars on law as it relates to literature, terrorism, and civil liberties. Before entering teacher, teaching, Professor Herman was pro se law clerk for the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and staff attorney and then associate director of Prisoners Legal Services of New York. Without further ado, please help me welcome Susan Herman. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you all for inviting me to speak here today. I thought I would start out by telling you a little bit about how the ACLU got started in the business of defending liberties and then moved to some more contemporary issues. So I can tell you that the ACLU was founded a little more than 90 years ago uh, in 1920 by a remarkable group of men and women who understood that, as we like to say, freedom cannot defend itself. When people say that we live in a free country, one thing they often mean is that the government can't punish us for saying what we think, even if what we have to say is unpopular or anti-government. 
That's our First Amendment freedom of speech as we understand it. But the First Amendment can't defend itself. And so during World War I, there were quite a number of people who were criminally prosecuted for speaking out against the war, against the government, or against the draft. And the Supreme Court did not reverse their convictions, as we might hope would happen today, because the court had not yet established the theories of freedom of speech that we tend to regard today as our birthright. And the court might never have gotten there to those cases establishing the kind of freedom of speech we value if it had not been for the participation of the ACLU. Another of our bedrock ideas about what it means to live in a free country is that in America, people are innocent until proven guilty, and we can't be arrested without probable cause or punished without a fair trial. But due process also can't defend itself. So another series of events that inspired the founding of the ACLU arose from the post-World War I Red Scare, the fear of anarchists and communists and whether they were about to take over the country. Now the fear of some of these anarchists was not wholly unfounded. So when Attorney General Mitchell Palmer uh, really had every reason to be distressed when a bomb that had evidently been intended for him exploded quite nearby. But, history tells us, Attorney General Palmer overreacted to this threat. On the night of January 2nd, 1920, the Department of Justice conducted a series of raids in 33 states all across the country, arresting anyone who looked foreign. Attorney General Palmer was quoted as saying that you could recognize dangerous foreigners because they looked, quote, sly and crafty. So over 4,000 people, sly and crafty looking people, were arrested and suffered many kinds of abuse that we don't like to associate with American justice. Arrests without warrants on trumped up charges, very unreasonable searches and seizures, wholesale destructions of property, physical brutality, and prolonged detention. In Hartford, Connecticut, for example, 97 suspects, crafty, sly foreigners, were held virtually incommunicado for five months. In Detroit, 800 suspects were held for as long as six days, also virtually incommunicado. Legal immigrants from Russia, from Italy, people who had done nothing wrong were summarily deported, thousands. And the public and press were supportive of all these measures because they had been assured by Attorney General Palmer that this was all necessary to ensure public safety. As the Washington Post opined, quote, there is no time to waste on hair splitting over infringement of liberty. Well, the ACLU was founded in 1920 with the mission to defend, among other things, the First Amendment and due process. And the repression of speech during World War I and the Palmer raids were two of the incidents that really did inspire that founding. So the first major action of the ACLU was to write and issue a report, which was called Report Upon the Illegal Practices of the United States Department of Justice. And this report chronicled and denounced the abuses that had been committed by those charged with the highest duty of enforcing the laws. Now, one reason why the ACLU used a communications strategy instead of just litigation at the time was that, as I was just saying, a number of the rights that we would today hope that courts would enforce had not yet been established. So had the ACLU simply gone to court, there probably would not have been any success to be had. But once the tide began to turn, the courts also played a role. There was one very courageous federal judge in Boston, Massachusetts, a judge named George Anderson, who just was determined to hold fair hearings before deporting people. And gradually, as public opinion began to be more informed about what was really going on and how our principles had just been elbowed out of the way in the interests of national security, public opinion did shift. Until today, when you say Palmer raids, that's a sort of a synonym for regrettable governmental abuse. Now, the Palmer raids are not often taught in school anymore, but this is an important part of our history. So, in addition to knowing that the Bill of Rights needed a lawyer, one of the ACLU's principal founders, Roger Baldwin, also made the deeply perceptive remark that no battle for civil liberties ever remains won. So to give you some sense of how history repeats itself, I'll start with one of the first major First Amendment cases the ACLU took on, the defense of a Tennessee school teacher during the 1920s for violating a Tennessee state law that prohibited teaching the theories of Charles Darwin. Sound familiar? Okay, who here saw Inherit the Wind, either the play or the movie? Okay, a lot of people. So if you saw the dramatic version of the Scopes trial, you probably have a sense that the Scopes trial, starring Clarence Darrow, who was one of the lawyers the ACLU engaged, you probably have a sense that this was a great victory for freedom of speech and religion. But in fact, did you know that that trial ended in a conviction? Did you also know that no court 
ever held in that case that the Tennessee law was unconstitutional. The case did not get to the Supreme Court. The Tennessee court, the appellate court, actually reversed the conviction on a technicality. So that was the Scopes case in 1920, the 1920s. At the ACLU's 90th anniversary celebration, which we had just in September, and we held it on Ellis Island, which we thought was a wonderfully fitting place to celebrate the ACLU's 90 years, I had the pleasure of meeting a woman named Susan Epperson, who was a 10th grade biology teacher in Little Rock, Arkansas, and became an ACLU client because she was prohibited from teaching evolution as part of her biology course. It was her case, Epperson versus Arkansas, in which the Supreme Court held for the first time that it actually is unconstitutional for a state to prohibit the teaching of evolution in a public school. You want to know what year that was? The Scopes trial was in the 1920s. This didn't happen until 1968. Okay, so over four decades later, it was necessary for the ACLU to litigate all the same issues that one would have hoped would have been settled in the Scopes trial. So at the dinner, Susan Epperson, who's you know, still a wonderful scientist, as is her daughter, also having learned a lot about science, Susan Epperson and I were discussing the fact that issues about the boundaries of religion and science and free speech have continued to follow us into the 21st century. You may be aware that more than one ACLU affiliate has had to look at state laws or practices that have similar problems. Uh, for example, the ACLU of Pennsylvania, just a few years ago, had to go to trial unfortunately won a case involving a requirement that school teachers in Dover, Pennsylvania teach intelligent design in addition to the theories of Charles Darwin. So the issues recur. As Roger Baldwin said, the battle for civil liberties is never over. And these same issues come back to uh, repeat themselves again and again. So my chief topic for today, as Sharon was saying, is the recurrence of the kind of abuse we learned to denounce after the Palmer raids. The whole idea of these national security dragnets that catch innocent people. You probably know that during World War II, the ACLU's California affiliates were particularly active in defending Japanese Americans who were forced to leave their homes and relocate solely because of their ancestry. Fred Korematsu, a name that I'm sure everybody knows, was a plumber who just wanted to live in his own home. But Fred got quite an education about due process during his experiences. And so when the Supreme Court more recently was hearing cases about whether or not de uh, detainees at Guantanamo are entitled to due process, Fred Korematsu filed an amicus brief on his behalf to tell the Supreme Court that the battle for civil liberties, which he lost, was repeating itself. Not everybody agrees with Fred Korematsu that there are parallels between what happened during the Palmer Raids, what happened during World War II, and some of the things that are happening today as a result of the, quote, war on terror. A little while ago, I was at a, a dinner that was just as elegant as this, and I was seated next to a woman who, knowing that I was president of the ACLU, said to me, so, tell me what the ACLU is doing these days, she said, but don't tell me about that Guantanamo stuff. She said, I am so tired of hearing about that. Why should I care about those people? They're not even Americans. So, Number one, you know, personally, I believe that there are reasons to care about people, even if they're not Americans. And I can tell you again, not everybody does. I was recently, I did a debate on Guantanamo and due process uh, for the detainees there um, at Pittsburgh Law School. And the person who I was debating, um, who I, I'll leave nameless in, in light of the story I'm about to tell you, but I got to go first. So one of the things that I was telling the audience, I was telling them the story of one young man at Guantanamo, Mohammed Jawad who was arrested when he didn't even know how old he was. He might have been 12, he might have been 15. But he had lived in Guantanamo for about seven years under you know, harsh and isolating conditions. And it turned out, when finally his case got before a court, that there was virtually no reliable evidence that he had ever done anything wrong at all. While he was at Guantanamo, however, his mental stability really became, you know, he became quite unhinged. He started trying to uh, commit suicide by banging his head against the wall of his cell and was seriously damaged. So finally, after years of confinement, a federal judge finally ordered that he be released and the Obama administration finally agreed to cooperate and this young man was sent home to Afghanistan. So because the debate was only about this issue, I actually described all the facts of the case in more detail than I'm telling you about it here today. So after I finished, my opponent stood up and he said to the audience, oh boo hoo, cue the violins, so mistakes were made. 
And I think you could hear my jaw hitting the table. I just you know, couldn't believe that anybody could take that attitude of, oh, boo-hoo, you know, who cares? So to me, a lot of the issues about Guantanamo are not even just constitutional issues or legal issues. To me, they're moral issues. What right do we have to lock up people who are innocent? Thank you. To me, you don't even need to get into the Geneva Conventions and does do due process rights apply in this patch of American soil or an American air base. To me, what actually answers the question for us is the golden rule. If you wouldn't want to be locked up in some foreign nation's jail for seven years, then I think we should not be purporting to lock up other people. Now, I'm sorry to tell you that another answer to the question that this woman asked me, why should I care, is that it is not only the people from Afghanistan who are affected from our policy, about, by our policies. It's not only people in Guantanamo. A lot of the policies that were initiated shortly after 9-11, you know, about the Patriot Act and its hundreds of amendments to previous law, and there are many other policies that continue to be with us, Many of those policies affect ordinary Americans, people who have done nothing wrong, who are citizens, who are living in this country. And I'm also sorry to tell you that those policies have not changed very much, despite the fact that the occupant of the White House changed. President Obama is continuing most of the policies that President Bush put into place shortly after 9-11, the policies about our rights and what rights American citizens have. And his lawyers are also defending almost everything that the Bush administration did. So, Last week, I was in Washington, D.C., where I got to watch an ACLU lawyer argue the case of Ashcroft versus Al Kidd. Um, this case was brought on behalf of a person who's an American citizen born in Wichita, Kansas, known uh, while he was a young man as Livoni Kidd. Well, Livoni Kidd went to college at the University of Idaho, and while he was there, he decided to convert to Islam. He changed his name to Abdullah Al Kidd because he had converted to Islam, and that was his choice. His family was, his grandfather was a Pentecostal minister. So his grandfather was not actually delighted that his grandson was leaving the church, but was actually pleased that he was still religion, religious and still had religion as part of his life. Well, somebody at the FBI evidently suspected Al Kidd of being part of an Al Qaeda sleeper cell in Moscow, Idaho, but couldn't even pretend to have enough evidence to arrest him. So what they did was they arrested him on the theory that he was a material witness, uh, needed for the trial of another person named Sami Al Hussein. A name you might recall, Sami Al Hussein was the Idaho graduate student who was charged with providing material support to terrorism on the theory that he had posted links on a website to inflammatory speech. The theory about what terrorists he was supporting kept shifting as the case went forward. At first, he was suspected of perhaps supporting Al-Qaeda, but when there was absolutely no evidence of that, the government switched to maybe it was Hamas or maybe it was Chechnyan rebels or somebody. And then what they ended up doing actually was also charging him with immigration violations on the theory that he was working unpaid for the Islamic Assembly as, as a webmaster. He was helping out various groups on campus. So Sami al Sain was on trial. Um, however, Abdullah al Kid was never called as a witness in his trial, even though he had been arrested as a material witness. What did happen to him was that he was locked up for 16 days under terribly harsh conditions. He was shipped all over the country to about four different states, flown all around in shackles. He was often kept naked. He was held under terrible conditions with noise at night and so forth, under you know, really horribly abusive conditions, and kept in cells where the um, government had previously kept people who they believed to be terrorists, not material witnesses. He stayed in the same cell, he was told by one guard, as John Walker Lind had stayed. And when, um, when Robert Mueller was telling Congress about the tremendous successes the FBI had had in catching terrorists, he mentioned Abdullah al-Kid's name as one of the terrorists who had been caught. So it was clear all along that, in fact, al-Kid was not somebody who was um, chiefly wanted to be a, a witness in the trial of Sami al-Hussein. Well, after 16 days, Abdullah was released. However, he was released under such onerous conditions. He had to stay with his in-laws. He had, was uh, circumscribed. He couldn't travel beyond an area of about four different states. And the conditions that were imposed on him were so onerous that he ended up losing his job and his marriage. You know, his wife just couldn't live under the conditions that were forced upon him. The trial of Sami al Hussein came and went. Sami al Hussein was acquitted of the material support charge because the jurors in Idaho got the First Amendment. They got that you cannot be prosecuted for your know, posting inflammatory speech even if that speech might inspire somebody to have their own thoughts about it. When the trial ended, nobody even told Abdullah al-Kid that the trial was over, and nobody moved to you know, release him from the conditions that had been imposed upon him. Now, 
When Attorney General Ashcroft first decided to use the material witness statute as a pretext for arresting people who he actually suspected of being terrorists but had no evidence against, this was in the face of a decision by Congress to the contrary. During the Patriot Act, Congress was asked to give the Attorney General powers of preventive detention. And what they did was they allowed the Attorney General to arrest for one week people who were not citizens. Abdullah Al-Kid was a United States citizen. He was held for 16 days in horribly onerous conditions, despite the fact that there was no probable cause for his arrest. Well, I'm pleased to tell you that we won the case on behalf of Abdullah Al-Kid in the Ninth Circuit on Bank. Uh, the Ninth Circuit recognized that, in fact, there were <laughs> serious abuses here, as alleged by Al-Kid, and thought that the case should go to trial. However, having heard the tenor of the Supreme Court argument, I can tell you that I'm very much concerned that the Supreme Court will not see it that way, and that like our president, the Supreme Court will want to provide immunity to Attorney General Ashcroft, because their theory seems to be, let's just turn the page on abuses. Let bygones be bygones. That's part of it. Why should we worry about accountability? It happened. Let's just move on. The second problem, I think, that is something that might be likely to motivate the Supreme Court is the fact that one of the things that was sold to us shortly after 9-11 is that we need to allow executive officials a great deal of discretion, which they exercise in secret, in order to protect us. And this is you know, another example of that sort of dragnet thinking. The attorney general should not be limited. One thing the government argued to the Supreme Court is, well, you wouldn't want an attorney general to flinch when it comes time to decide about arresting somebody. Well, I don't know about you, but I do want people with the power to arrest to flinch sometimes if they don't have evidence for arresting people. So accountability has been a major problem throughout the you know, um, era after 9-11. Uh, Any time a great deal of discretion is afforded to people, no matter who those people are, no matter how good we think they are or how much good faith we think they have, if they're exercising discretion in secret, that is a recipe for abuse. One Supreme Court justice once said that the greatest threat to civil liberties is from men of good faith who become overzealous. And I think that's exactly true. You know, people often have a good motive. Attorney General Palmer was not coming from no place. And you know, certainly when we were at war in World War II, there was some threat from Japan. But there is such a thing as overdoing it. So one of the first things that the ACLU was up against in the fall of 2001 was to just try to find out what was going on. You can't go to court and start challenging things if you don't know what was going on. So we became masters of the Freedom of Information Act. One of the first things the ACLU tried to find out was who it was who had been picked up off the street and arrested and detained. We also tried to find out what had been happening to the people who had been picked up, what was happening, what kinds of interrogation policies were being used. We asked for, among other things, those famous Office of Legal Counsel memos in which the Office of Legal Counsel had advised the Bush administration that it wasn't really torture if, and then they came up with tortured definitions about what wasn't really torture. So there were two young lawyers in our national security project, Jamil Jaffer and Amrit Singh, who came up really with the strategy of using the Freedom of Information Act to try to find out what the government was doing. And there was a senior lawyer in the office who thought that they were really being very naive and unrealistic to expect that this was going to really be a way to get any sort of information. So he said to them, wow, you know, you really think that the government is just going to turn over documents about what they've been doing? He said, I'll give you a nickel for every page you get from the government. <laughs> well, I am sorry to tell you that hundreds of thousands of pages later, that lawyer has actually reneged on the deal. <laughs> Would have been a lot of nickels. So the next thing that happened was that even having found out some of what was happening, partially through the Freedom of Information Act documents, and partially because there were reporters out there who were reporting things that the government was doing, um, we did start going to court. We represented any number of people, including we've represented people who were victims of torture and of extraordinary rendition. I don't know if you've all heard the term extraordinary rendition. That means we send people to another country to let them be tortured there. That's what's extraordinary about the rendition, is we know what's going to happen to people once we're shipping them to other places, but do it anyway. So among the ACLU clients have been Khaled al-Masri, who was a German man of Lebanese descent, who was plucked off of a bus while he was on vacation in Macedonia and sent to a black hole in, in Afghanistan, where he was kept under horribly abusive conditions, tortured, interrogated for five months, while it became increasingly obvious to the people who had captured him that he was just the wrong guy. He had a name similar to somebody else. 
So he was finally released. They, released, they flew him to Albania and released him in the hills and just said, OK, turn your back on the car and walk away. He said he thought he was going to be shot. But what happened instead was he was found by Albanian security agents who wanted to know what was he doing in Albania without proper papers. So um, El Masri, we brought a lawsuit on his behalf, which was dismissed on the ground of the state secrets privilege. The same thing happened with another of our extraordinary rendition clients, Binyam Mohammed, dismissed on the basis of the state secrets privilege. As the ACLU lawyer in that case, Ben Wisner, remarked, he said, this courtroom seems to be the only place in the world where you can't talk about what happened to these people. This is not a secret. Everybody knows. So I'm sorry to have to report to you that despite our lawyers' best efforts, there is not a single victim of torture or extraordinary rendition who has had a day in court. Either the state secrets privilege or other you know, procedural obstacles, standing, et cetera, have all led to every single one of those cases being dismissed. The same thing happened to most of our cases trying to challenge surveillance practices after 9-11. The National Security Agency practices, a lot of the Patriot Act provisions, the courts say, oh, well, you don't have standing to challenge secret surveillance unless you can show that you were a victim of the secret surveillance. Notice the catch-22. If the surveillance is so secret, how can you know? OK, very rare to be able to know. So the courts basically have abdicated. Now, you in Portland have certainly seen some of the fallout of the war on terror. Uh, Brandon Mayfield, who was also arrested as a material witness, can tell you what it's like to be suspected of terrorism because of your religion, and to have the government use the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, originally designed to keep an eye on the Soviet Union during the Cold War, to spy on an American citizen. Even after his innocence was conclusively established, Brandon discovered that the government would not return the records that they had seized from his home and his office, because those records are now disseminated among data banks in all sorts of federal agencies. Government just thinks that's their right. Why should they have to return any records? A second Portland resident, a Mohammed Sheikh Abderrahman Karier, who is the imam of the Islamic Center of Portland, is also an American citizen. But because his name is now on a no-fly list, he's not able to visit his daughter, who lives in Dubai, or fly to California on business. He's also now, he's a plaintiff in an ACLU lawsuit challenging the no-fly lists. Now, we believe that the no-fly lists are highly unreliable. They're compiled in secret on the basis of hearsay information. And again, there's no accountability. There is no real opportunity for an individual whose name is on the no-fly list to challenge what's the information. Why am I on the no-fly list? Who told you something about me? You can never rebut the information or you know, figure out why the government has put people on, on the lists. But at least in uh, Mr. Carrier's case, he's not in the position of some other ACLU clients who have been living outside the country and who were effectively banished because they're unable to fly home. There's one veteran named Eman Latif who was living in Egypt who wanted to fly home to visit his family because he had a new baby and he wanted to fly to Miami, show the baby to the family, gets to the airport and is told he's not allowed to fly. Well, OK, he's not allowed to fly. So this starts a long Kafka-esque series of episodes where he's trying to deal with the American consulate and the FBI and trying to talk people into letting him fly back. Meanwhile, not only is Mr. Latif a veteran, but he's a disabled veteran. So a lot of his income is that he's getting uh, disability pay through the Veterans Administration. So he receives a letter from the Veterans Administration saying that his disability benefits are being cut. Why? Because he didn't show up for his personal physical examination in the United States that's required to continue the disability benefits. Okay, catch 22. So uh, Mr. Latif, ultimately, after the lawsuit started, uh, Mr. Latif was told that he would be given one-time permission just to fly back to the United States, although nobody could promise that he could even get back home to Cairo after that or what was going to happen. However, at this point, he doesn't have enough money to afford the ticket. So you know, there's another example of an American citizen who um, is suffering some of the fallout of the war on terror. Uh, my final Portland example that I thought I would get to is the ever-popular question of the rejoining of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. There's just demonstration hearings going on uh, that have been postponed until next week. I think the issue of rejoining the, pass, uh, the, the Joint Terrorism Task Force also raises some very challenging issues of accountability and secrecy. Now, FBI agents, federal agents, have a lot of enhanced powers under the Patriot Act and other federal policies that I find to be really frighteningly broad. 
They have a lot of surveillance powers under the Patriot Act where they don't have to ever get permission from a court to do certain kinds of surveillance. And they also have the power, the authority, to send infiltrators into religious and political meetings. Federal law says you can't send an infiltrator into a mosque or a political meeting solely on the basis of the religion or you know, the philosophy espoused, but that solely is a pretty loaded word. That's the federal law. Um, the other thing that they're allowed to do is they're allowed, as, as Brandon Mayfield's case shows, to retain records on innocent people. So if they go around and, and see you know, your anti-war activities and other things that you're doing, that can cause files to be you know, lodged about you in all sorts of federal data banks. Now, on the other hand, um, Oregon law is much more respectful of First Amendment freedom of speech, association, and religion, and far more selective about what records can be retained. So the Oregon law um, requires that you cannot send somebody to spy on a political or religious group unless there's actually reasonable suspicion to believe that there's some sort of criminal activity afoot. You can't just do it because you feel like it. Now, this law was based on a series of incidents that had occurred where police officers in Oregon and, and Portland police officers had, in fact, been spying on the ACLU, anti-war groups, and all sorts of other groups. So the Oregon law is trying to provide a little bit of extra protection by limiting the discretion. You can send an infiltrator in if you want, but you have to have a reason to do it. You can't just be fishing. There's a wonderful ACLU report from a couple of years ago called Blocking Faith, Freezing Charity, which talks about the impact of federal measures on Islamic charities, mostly, in the United States. And in it, there are interviews with you know, over 100 Muslims around the country who talk about how terrorized they've been by FBI infiltrators in their mosques just looking for anything to you know, cast suspicion on anybody. And the terrible impact that that's had on the Muslim community. People are afraid to exercise their religion. They're afraid to give to Muslim charities because they're afraid they're going to be investigated. And I think it's very difficult to argue that all of this is a good way to prevent terrorism because it looks to me like it's really highly counterproductive. A number of the Muslims interviewed said that they would love to cooperate with the FBI, but at this point they're so scared of them that they just want to stay away and hide from them, and they just you know, are not getting involved in anything. Well, the memorandum of understanding that the Portland City Council declined to sign in 2005 made the price of joining the Joint Terrorism Task Force allowing Portland police office to operate in secret under the supervision of federal agents instead of the supervision of their own civilian employers. So here are these Portland police officers, and they're in the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Federal law says, go ahead, you can send the infiltrators into mosques and political groups. Oregon law says, you can't unless you, we have a higher standard. Well, we all know what happens. Uh, what happened to Pavlov's dogs when they were subjected to two different sets of rules? It's pretty difficult you know, to operate with the two different sets of rules. So even if the Portland police officers fully intended to refuse to violate Oregon law themselves, there's no reason to think that they would even have full information about what was going on before any sort of infiltration activities took place because the federal agents don't need to worry about that. They don't have to meet the same standard. So they just aren't doing the same kind of homework that the Oregon police officers would be required to do. So, you know, I don't have the time or really um, expertise to get into all the facts today, but if you want a very eye-opening account of the history of the actual abuses in Portland, including the Portland police officers' activities in the past, read the testimony before the city council on February 15th by Andrea Meyer, the legislative director and counsel of the ACLU of Oregon. Um, it's on the ACLU website, and she details a lot of reasons to be concerned. And again, this is not about the Portland police in particular is not to say that they're not good people. It's just that the Constitution is a very distrustful document. And the distrust in the Constitution is not personal. The whole idea is that even men of good faith can be tempted to be overzealous if they're trying to accomplish something important and, and valuable, like keeping people secure. But that's the reason why we have these structures, is to make sure that there's always accountability, that there's always somebody else to provide a check so that people don't go overboard and we don't end up with Mitchell Palmer. One of the, the, I'll sort of tell you this is my constitutional law professor hat, you know, the people in Oregon can tell you what's been happening here. But one of the strategies that the Constitution has to prevent abuses, to prevent tyranny and government overreaching, which is just every bit as important as the Bill of Rights, 
is structural provisions, parts of which are the checks and balances among the, the levels of the federal government. So one thing that's been happening since 9-11 is that Congress and the courts have not really been you know, doing their share to try to check what's been going on in the executive branch. But the other, uh, the third sort of plane of the Constitution, which is equally important, is the plane of federalism. One thing that the framers of the Constitution did, as one Supreme Court justice once said, is they, quote, split the atom of sovereignty. So in our federalist system, the federal government has supremacy under the Supremacy Clause, and if they want to come into Oregon and enforce their Patriot Act provisions, they get to do that because they're supreme. And it doesn't really matter if the people in Oregon don't like what they're doing because the federal government does have supremacy. But on the other hand, because the states and cities do have a certain amount of autonomy, the federal government also can't force individual people in the states and cities to help them with their federal program. So that's why Oregon has the right and the power and the privilege to be more protective of liberties in Oregon if they wish to. The Oregonian has been asking the question, well, why in the world would only Portland be objecting to the Joint Terrorism Task Force? Is this just Portland weirdness? Well, I think what it is, it's, it's Oregon weirdness, but it's a very good kind of weirdness because it's a weirdness that says, we want to protect the First Amendment more fully than the federal government is at this point. So what I think is fascinating about the, point, the Joint Terrorism Task Force issue is that it really sort of crystallizes this whole question about local autonomy opposing federal power. Uh, this is something that has a long history in our country. In 1798, uh, under President John Adams, there was an absolutely terrible and draconian sedition law passed. And the reason this sedition law passed, which punished speech of all sorts of people, which was considered to be anti-government, was that the people in 1798, if you think about your American history, were extremely worried about British sleeper cells. They were very worried about whether their new government was going to be able to continue. And in fact, they were right to worry. Remember the War of 1812, which came after that? It was a serious problem. While the federal government passed its Sedition Act, Virginia and Kentucky, the two different states, passed resolutions which have become very famous to say, we don't think so. We disagree. We think that this sedition law violates the First Amendment. So very interesting tradition that the states can form their own opinions. It's not just everybody has to listen to what the federal government wants to do. The states are entitled to and can push back. They can't prevent the federal people from coming into Portland or Virginia to enforce the Sedition Law or the Patriot Act, but they can refuse to pile on and help out with their own resources. So shortly after 2001, there was an organization called the Bill of Rights Defense Committee that together with the ACLU organized a um, initiative all around the country to get cities, towns, and villages, as well as a number of states, to sign on to resolutions saying, we really don't like the Patriot Act. We think it's overreaching. And we know we don't have choices about when federal officers come in and do what they do, but we don't want to help. And we want to instruct our local people, don't lend local power to help with these abuses. Well, um, in a period of time, over a, a period of a few years, over 400 cities, towns, and villages, and eight states signed on to those, those resolutions in one form or another. Portland was one of those cities. Oregon was not one of those states, but there were eight other states. And the 400 cities include the big ones, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco. So it's a very interesting example, again, of the local, you know, the state and local powers being used to resist what people saw as federal overreaching. And to me, what's fascinating as a constitutional law professor is that the structures of federalism actually did a better job than rights in the court of pushing back against federal power. In the fall of 2001, when the FBI wanted to question 5,000 Arab and Muslim men just to ask, did they know anything about terrorism, there were chiefs of police in Portland, as well as in Detroit, who said, we're not going to do that. We don't question people unless we have a reason to go after them. Okay, and so that, that pushed back, that said to the FBI, you know, you want to do this, you're going to have to find the manpower and the budget, you know, get a budget from Congress and do it yourself. But Portland is not going to cooperate. So the issue about the Joint Terrorism Task Force is, is the money in Portland going to be used to fund Portland police officers who are subject to federal rules and federal supervision and not to the supervision of people in Portland? What this is all about is, um, 
It's about accountability, and it's about lines of authority. The question is whether or not the Portland police officers are going to be answerable to the people who pay their salaries, whether the city attorney is going to be able to find out whether, in fact, the Oregon law is being violated, or whether, in fact, the FBI is going to be calling all the shots, as they did when they wrote the memorandum of understanding that the city council refused to sign last time to say, we're going to call all the shots. We decide who gets to know things. We decide on security clearances. We decide when there needs to be secrecy. Not your problem. Now, to me, given Portland, giving Portland police officers the power to look the other way when Oregon law is, is violated is, as a matter of principle, a lot like giving Attorney General Ashcroft the power to decide to stretch the material witness law to arrest an innocent man, or to give Attorney General Palmer the power to arrest and deport immigrants because he thinks they look sly and crafty. The rule of law and the structures of accountability are worth fighting for. So if Portland wants to rejoin the Joint Terrorism Task Force, I think you need to take very seriously ensuring that people whose salaries you pay are accountable to you, and that your state law, which quite admirably resists the McCarthyist hysteria that is now affecting the House of Representatives, is really respected. Now, I could give you many, many other examples of why I think the war on terror poses some of the most uh, serious threats to our civil liberties. And one reason for that is that I'm in the process right now of finishing writing a book which describes the impact of the war on terror on ordinary Americans to be published by Oxford University Press in the fall. I was just told that I should really come back here in the fall to uh, appear at Powell's, which I would love to do because I happen to think that Powell's is the best bookstore in the country. Here, here. <laughs> If not, perhaps, would you say, in the world? Uh, so, you know, I'm, focusing on these issues uh, means that I've had to leave out all sorts of other defense of liberty that the um, ACLU is doing around the country. We've been fighting uh, attempts to restrict reproductive freedom. We've been fighting over-incarceration. We had a lot to do with the Barack Obama administration recent decision to not defend the Defense of Marriage Act. A um, whole other story. Happy to talk about that there during the Q&A if you'd like to talk about that. Uh, but since I don't have very much more time here and I do want to allow time for questions, I'm going to just leave all of that out. You know, the story is not entirely bleak, but there are a whole lot of issues. So um, during the question and answer period, you can tell me whether you think I've had an incredible amount of, of chutzpah, an Eastern term, to come here and talk to you about issues that are occurring in Oregon and Portland. So I want to close by telling you actually a little story. I think this happened in Portland. I used to speak a lot for the Federal Judicial Center before I became president of the ACLU. So on one occasion, I was giving a speech to 60 or 80 federal judges, and it was the year that the Vernonia School District versus Acton case had been decided. That was a case that got to the Supreme Court about drug testing of students in the Vernonia schools. So I was about to speak about what the Supreme Court had done in this case to this nice group of judges when a very nice man came up to me and said, hi, I'm Reginald Marsh, and I was the judge in this case, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. <laughs> Okay, lawyers, how much do you want to tell a judge who sat through you know, the month of trials or whatever about what his case was about? So Judge Marsh, I don't know if any of you knew him, was a wonderful man. So he sat in the front row and smiled at me the whole time and nodded and kind of listened while I was you know, talking as carefully as I could and with great trepidation. So after I finished speaking, he came up to me and he said, well, I really enjoyed your speech. You know, that was really great. It was just wonderful. But there's just one place where I have to correct you. And I thought, oh, no, <laughs> what have I missed? What fact did I get wrong? And he said, why do you Easterners always say Oregon? <laughs> so if you'll help me out, I will end by saying how delightful it is to be here to, with you today in Portland. Oregon. Thank you. <laughs> The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host, and our host today is City Club Governor Mac Pritchard. Mac is the founder of Pritchard Communications, a public relations firm that serves foundations, nonprofits, and public agencies across the country. He joined City Club in 2003 and served on the Agora Committee for two years. Mac? Thanks, Sharon, and thanks, uh, Susan. I want to come back to the, uh, the Portland Terrorism uh, Task or the, the Joint Ter Task Force on Terrorism. One of the arguments that is being made now when the City Council uh, takes up this issue again later this month is with a change in administration, a change of leadership in the Department of Justice, uh, it's, it's okay to join the task force. 
Uh, what, what advice would you give city councilors who are hearing that argument later this month? Well, thanks for your question, Mac. Um, it's a great question, and I think that we all hoped, because Barack Obama was the candidate of change, that there would be a lot of change in the federal government and that the FBI would be highly different. I was just describing to you a lot of the ways in which the Department of Justice is, is not so different. You know, I think Eric Holder is a different attorney general. But a lot of the FBI agents who are um, working for the federal government are the same people who were there during the Bush years. Barack Obama will not be president forever. And I think, first of all, and I think to um, change a policy because of who's in office, is, it feels to me a little short-sighted is, is one kind of answer. What I was just saying is that I think that the structures of accountability shouldn't be put aside because you trust the person. I mean, that's what you know, people would have said about Attorney General Palmer, but we trust him, or Attorney General Ashcroft. I trust Attorney General Holder, but I don't trust him in, in, in that kind of way. You know, it's not that I don't think he's a good man, but I think any person who you give discretionary power to to exercise in secret is going to be tempted if they think they're doing something righteous and valuable, which they are. They're going to be tempted to cut some corners, and I think the history shows that they do. My second answer is not just from me, but again, I would refer you to the history of an ACLU employee on the staff named Mike German. Mike used to work for the FBI, and he became concerned enough about how the FBI was using its powers during the Bush year that he came to work for the ACLU. Mike just came out here to testify, was it before the city council, Dave? Okay, and he testified, and is his testimony on the ACLU website? Okay, so you can find it. And what Mike German says is that the FBI is not so different. And he points to things going on at fusion centers around the country where there continue to be concerns about FBI agents infiltrating anti-war meetings and religious meetings, et cetera. So the problem has not gone away. But to me, you know, the, the factual argument is an important argument, but the structural argument to me is even more important. You don't say, well, we don't need judicial review of whether or not we can spy on Americans because we just are going to trust the attorney general to just to make good decisions. The whole point of the Constitution is you, know, you trust, but you keep your rights loaded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We will now take questions from the floor. Asking questions at Friday Forums is a privilege of membership. Uh, before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If I flash my question mark card, it means that we're still waiting for the question. Thank you. Ted Kay, City Club member. Many states have enacted laws against flag burning and many people call for a constitutional amendment against desecration of the flag. At the same time, the United States Flag Code says that the way to dispose of old flags is by burning them respectfully. So it seems the only difference between proper flag disposal and flag desecration is what one is thinking when burning the flag. That sounds like a First Amendment issue to me. Would you tell us the ACLU's position on the issue? <laughs> This is not a plant, I promise. <laughs> this, is, this is a real question. Yeah, I think you can guess the ACLU position on this. We very much believe in freedom of expression. And for years now, there have been a number of proposals in Congress to amend the First Amendment by making an exception for the criminalization of flag burning. There's actually a history here. Texas had a law criminalizing flag desecration. And the Supreme Court decided in, I think it was 1989, in a case called Texas versus Johnson, that it was a violation of the First Amendment to prosecute somebody, just as our speaker suggested, for burning a flag to express an opinion. It's speech, it's expressing an opinion. We completely agreed with that, and probably if we look back at the records, I suspect would have filed a brief in that case. So Congress then was deciding whether or not to um, write an amendment to the Constitution to reverse Texas versus Johnson. And instead, somewhat cooler heads prevailed, and instead Congress passed a law a, a federal law criminalizing flag desecration. So that case then came to the Supreme Court, United States versus Eichmann, I believe that was 1990, and the Supreme Court said once again, well, it's still a violation of the First Amendment. So ever since then, uh, in many, uh, many different Congresses, I couldn't off the top of my head tell you how many, there have been many proposals to amend the Constitution by allowing for criminalizing desecration of the flag. We think this would be a very great mistake. It would be the first time that there ever would have been an amendment to the Constitution to dilute a right, a free expression right. And we think, you know, it, there's, I understand that people feel very strongly about the flag. There are many things that people feel strongly about. 
And it is, you know, Sharon was saying in her introduction that the ACLU is sometimes unpopular. Well, it's our job to be unpopular because when people like Nazis or the Ku Klux Klan have horrible, nasty things to say that we disagree with, we nevertheless defend them because we think you have to. If you start saying there can be exceptions to free speech for speech that we really, really, really don't like that's really obnoxious, then you're just, you know, that's the slippery slope and there's, there's no end to it. So, you know, we do take you know, a, a pretty absolute position on um, the free speech issues. Actually, let me tell you a little story about how um, avid we are about <laughs> free speech, one of my favorite current stories. So one of the things that right-wing bloggers are on about these days is that the ACLU is hypocritical. And what they say is, well, you know, we defend the speech of Muslims and Klan members and, and Nazis and terrible people like that and people who want to desecrate the flag. But we don't defend, you know, good, wholesome Americans. So one of the things that a number of right-wing bloggers complained about was there was a school in Northern California that was about to celebrate Cinco de Mayo. And a number of students who didn't like, you know, Anglo students who didn't like the idea of, of celebrating Cinco de Mayo decided that they were going to wear T-shirts to school saying, America, love it or leave it, or something like that with American flags on it. So the right-wing bloggers all picked up a chorus, well, where was the ACLU when it was time to defend these kids? You want to know the answer? The ACLU was defending the kids and saying to the principal, let them wear their T-shirts. Okay, so my favorite example, in Virginia, the ACLU was required to um, tell the principal of this one high school that it was actually a problem to have school-sponsored prayer at the football game. You can have student-sponsored prayer at the football game, that's fine, but you can't have an establishment of religion and therefore you can't have the state deciding what's, what's everybody's religion gonna be. So there were a number of students who were very annoyed by this, who felt that they had the right to you know, have a school prayer at the football game. So they all wanted to wear t-shirts, you know, essentially saying, you know, we hate the ACLU, we should have the right to pray at our football games. And the principal told them that they couldn't do that because that was gonna cause a disturbance. <laughs> Can you see it coming? The ACLU of Virginia defended them. <laughs> they have the right to protest the ACLU if they want. So, you know, whatever the speech is, we often have to hold our noses, but, you know, we do believe in the principle of free speech. Sir. Hi, Fred Mathis, a uh, member. There are individuals who meet criteria for serious mental illness but to not seek help voluntarily. What is the ACL? current position regarding involuntary commitment of such individuals. Um, okay, well, without having the poli particular policy in front of me, I can't give you too much detail, but the basic principle that we have is that there has to be due process and that there has to be a standard. And if an individual really is of danger to him or herself or to the community, after an appropriate process to determine that, it is appropriate to involuntarily commit a person. But absent the due process and absent a standard like that, we think that there has to be, you know, where liberty is concerned, that there does have to be a serious due process standard. Paul Milius, City Club member, and proudly a card-carrying member of the ACLU. Thank you. Um, <laughs> along with the war on terror, there's been an even longer standing war being waged against the American people, the war on drugs. Would you care to comment how the war on drugs has eroded our civil liberties and how those erosions have over, spilled over into other kinds of criminal justice uh, situations? Um, well, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, we very much agree with the uh, point of the speaker that the war on drugs has been the occasion for eroding many civil liberties, including the Fourth Amendment, you know, our right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. There are many, many cases in which the courts have made exceptions to the Fourth Amendment in order to allow searches for drugs. And that's one of the reasons why the Fourth Amendment is not there to protect us when it comes to surveillance of American citizens for all sorts of other reasons. Um, I think I'm going to take your question also in, uh, to comment on one of our current initiatives, which is one of the most important things I think we're doing now, which is to fight the general trend to over-incarceration. The war on drugs is one of the reasons why the prison population has absolutely skyrocketed. It has quadrupled during a period of time where the, the crime rates have not gone up. And when you look at the statistics, we incarcerate as an absolute matter, even though we have 5% you know, of the world's population, we, I believe the figures are, we incarcerate 25% of the world's prisoners. We incarcerate more people as an absolute number and per capita than any country in the world, including the more populous China, which is number two, or Russia, which is number three. 
a lot of this was fueled by the war against drugs and by the, the feeling that we needed to lock up people who had commit not, committed nonviolent times for very long periods of time. Now, talk about counterproductive. I think this is very bad policy, for one thing, because you take people, you disrupt their lives, you disrupt their families, you disrupt their social safety nets, and you're, you're not going to be preventing crime. Uh, plus, there are terrible implications in terms of race for over-incarceration. That's another thing that the war against drugs has really both caused and exposed, that um, the percentages of the impact of um, incarceration policies on the basis of race um, there's a wonderful book written by my former board, board colleague, uh, ACLU board colleague, as well as former ACLU staff member, Michelle Alexander, called The New Jim Crow. Anybody see that? It's a great book. I'm sure Powell's has it. 60% um, of our prison population now is people of color. One in nine young African American men are incarcerated at a, incarceration at a higher rate than any other group of Americans. We incarcerate Latinos at twice the rate of their white counterparts. And a lot of this, again, is because of drug crime. If you look at the statistics, minorities do not commit any more drug crime than, than people who are not people of color. But yet the incarceration rates, every stage, the arrest rates, the conviction rates, the incarceration rates are all horribly racially skewed. So I think the war on drugs has had really a, a terrible impact. Carl Twombly, City Club member. Do you think there's a problem with treating the war on terrorism as if it was a actual legal war rather than just political rhetoric like the war on drugs or the war on poverty? Uh, yes, I, I do think that the metaphor of the war on terror has been taken much too far. Uh, under the initial strategy of the Bush administration, by calling the war on terror a war, that gave us power, the power to act outside our criminal justice system. When Guantanamo was first set up, it was set up to be a land without law, with no law at all, because the Bush administration took at the same time the position that we could treat terrorists as, as um, enemy combatants, we could treat them as if we were at war with them, but at the same point, we didn't have to give them the rights under the Geneva Conventions. Now, we were very disappointed when the other day President Obama announced that he's going to be continuing military tribunals in Guantanamo, and when he's really, he's been unable to keep his um, promise that he made in his first day executive order to close <coughs> Guantanamo. But I'm actually rather empathetic with President Obama because he's in a position that no American president ever should have been in because the exceptions that were being made on the theory that we could lock up whoever we wanted for as long as we wanted with no law whatever are what got us into the fix that we're in, where we have all these people and we don't have the evidence to try them in the criminal justice system. What the Geneva Conventions say is that under the rules of war, if we're at war with Nazi Germany, say, we are not permitted to try Nazi soldiers who we capture for a crime. They're supposed to kill American soldiers. That's their job, and therefore we cannot try them for murder but we can hold them until the hostilities end to keep them from killing more Americans. So President Bush took the position that because this is a war, we can hold people for the duration of hostilities. So part of my problem with the war metaphor is when does the war on terror end? Yeah, how do you assign a truce? You know, there, you know, it's indefinite, there's no end in sight. And at the same time, because this is not a matter of a nation fighting a nation, uh, there's no reason why we can't prosecute people for crime. The usual more war model you use because you cannot use a criminal justice model. There is nothing to prevent us from using a criminal justice model here. Terrorists are criminals and they should be tried for crime. And just like you know, people who are mentally ill, they shouldn't be locked up unless we have some evidence that they've committed a crime. One more question we have time for, sir. Sorry, uh, Fred. My name is David DeMarkey. I'm a city club member. And uh, my question is, how do we balance um, civil liberties uh, with uh, I mean, the stated civil liberties such as freedom of speech with the implicit civil liberties such as um, right to privacy. And, and what I have in mind is the Westboro Baptist Church challenge where some states, Oregon included, are considering laws to create uh, privacy zones around people's uh, funerals to uh, uh, limit uh, these demonstrations. What, what's the ACLU's... Uh, viewpoint on this? Well, another you know, great question because that's another very difficult area and one where we make ourselves unpopular by sometimes parting with our usual friends and allies in our answers. 
The day that I was in the Supreme Court on Wednesday when, to hear the all kid argument was also the day that the uh, Supreme Court announced their decision in Snyder versus Phelps, where they announced that these people from the Westboro Church, who, you know, does everybody know about the Westboro Church people? They, they believe that it's perfectly okay for them to go and harass the families of, of um, veterans who have died for their country and to tell them that the reason their sons and daughters have died is that the United States is not sufficiently homophobic, so God is punishing us. Okay, can you think of a message that you know, the ACLU would disagree with more? But nevertheless, we wrote the amicus brief to say, okay, once again, we're holding our noses and saying free speech is free speech. They were on a public sidewalk. They have the right to say their horrible things. Now, I think what's appropriate in this situation is the same kind of thing that's appropriate in the abortion clinic cases. And that's one example of a place where we often have our friends at Planned Parenthood and other organizations we frequently work with on reproductive freedom who disagree with us about the extent of speech. They don't think that protesters have any business being anywhere near abortion clinics. But we've been involved in the very complicated effort that the courts have undergone in the abortion clinic cases to try to create buffer zones. So we, it, despite the fact that we believe wholeheartedly in the First Amendment, the First Amendment also does allow for time, place, and manner restrictions. So there's no reason not to say in the abortion clinic cases, and we've written a lot of briefs about this, that you can say to the protesters, you have to stay X feet away from the clinic. You have to stay X feet away from a woman who's coming into the clinic. Women have kind of bubbles around them. The abortion clinic can have a kind of a bubble. And they're all very complex time, place, and manner restrictions to be worked out. And I think that's also the appropriate approach for the funerals. You can't tell people not to speak, but it is perfectly appropriate to tell them that they're not allowed to speak in your living room. So I think on that um, quote, you note that civil liberties are not always easy to defend. I think that's a great place to end because no matter what it is, we try our best. So all become card-carrying members, visit our website, and thank you for listening. <laughs> Bye. We've run out of time for further questions and we'll have to stop for the day. Join us next week for a discussion of another very hot issue in the news, collective bargaining. And as we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation to today's guest, Susan Herman. Thank you so much. We're adjourned. Thank you.